Patty's Calculus Videos, written and performed by me, Patty Leitner. Part 2 Derivatives Section 2.7 Tangent Lines, Derivatives, and Velocity Lesson 1 Tangent Lines and Slopes Okay, so today we start a brand new topic. We have already talked about two of the very important concepts that come up in first semester calculus, namely limits and continuity. The next thing we're going to talk about are tangent lines and derivatives, and towards the end of this section we will talk about rates of change. In your textbook, the section that we're going to be covering next covers sections 2.1, 2.7, and 2.8, and I've kind of recombined them in a way that I think flows a little bit more naturally than the way it is introduced in the text. So let's go ahead and get started, and we're going to start by talking about tangent lines. Let me remind you that lots of things in life are quantities that change. Um, and here are just some examples of a zillion different things that you could think of. A car moving along the road, so its distance is changing in time. A jet flying, same idea, distance is changing in time, or perhaps its height is changing in time. The growth of a population, so you look at a small town and over the years the population might change. Spread of swine flu or any kind of disease. As time goes on, perhaps more and more people catch the flu, or when a vaccine is introduced, perhaps fewer and fewer people are catching it. Movement of a hurricane, the way that it changes um, size and speed and um, how, uh, how vicious a storm it is can change. The height of a person over their lifetime, usually you grow during your adolescence and then you sort of peak out at a certain height. Flow of traffic through a network, so if you think of, say, a freeway interchange or something like that, the way that the traffic flows is a way of um, cars or shifting position uh, in time. And temperature change over a 24-hour period, so you have a thermometer sitting there and you measure the temperature outside of your house over 24 hours, that temperature is going to change in time. All of these ideas of quantities that change in time, or sometimes we will even look at quantities that change with respect to a different input variable other than time, all of these quantities are connected to one idea, and that may be a little bit surprising. They're all connected to the idea of the slope of the tangent line. And we're going to talk about what we mean by the tangent line in just a few minutes to a curve. And that might be surprising that such diverse phenomena all relate to exactly the same concept in mathematics, but that's part of the power of mathematics is that one concept in math can apply to a zillion different situations in real life. Well, what I'd like us to do for a moment is just to review the idea of slope, because we'll be looking at what is called the slope of the tangent line to a curve, and so we need to review this idea of slope so let's go ahead and review the idea of the slope of a straight line. That's something we've learned about since beginning algebra. And we know how to find the slope of a straight line that goes through two points. What I would like us to do in this first example is perhaps imagine a truck driving along a straight roadway. So here's the truck, he's going in this direction, and along the x-axis is how many feet that truck has moved horizontally. Along the y-axis is how many feet that truck has moved vertically. If I want to talk about the slope of this roadway, you might remember that the slope has to do with how far the truck moves vertically as compared to how far the truck moves horizontally as he moves from one point to another point along the roadway. So in this case, he's moving from the point 3, 10 
I'll just put that in parentheses here, 310, up to this other point, 5, 16. And if I want to figure out how far he's moved horizontally, that's usually what we call the change in x, and we use a little triangle here for the change or the difference in the x values. And remember, all that means is we are doing the difference in these x values. We're doing 5 minus 3 and getting 2. So this truck has moved to the right to horizontal feet. If I want to figure out how far he has moved vertically as he moves from 310 up to 516, that's the change in the y values. You can either look at it here under the roadway or over here on the y-axis, but the change in the y values is just the change in the y-coordinates of these points. He's gone from a height of 10 feet to a height of 16 feet. 16 minus 10 would be 6 feet. So as he moves 2 feet horizontally, he moves 6 feet vertically. And the slope of this line, remember that slope is just the change in the y values. It's how far vertically he's moved, his change in elevation, over the change in x values, how far he has moved horizontally. And for this particular picture, we said the change in the y is 6, so 6 vertical feet divided by 2, that's how far he's moved horizontally, so 2 horizontal feet. And we would say then that the slope of this road is 6 over 2, or 3. Well, let's look at the second picture that I have over here. And here we have the truck going along another straight roadway. He still goes through the point 3, 10, 10. But now he's going to go to the point 5, 22. So if we were to figure out the change that he makes horizontally, delta x, or the change in x, that would still be 5 minus 3, or 2 horizontal feet. But the change vertically has changed, and delta y, the change or difference in the y values, is now 22 minus 10. So it's now a change of 12 vertical feet. If I figured out the slope again by doing delta y over delta x, the delta x is the same. He's still going two horizontal feet. But the change in y is more. He's going uh, a bigger elevation change for the same horizontal change. So the change in y, we said, is 12 vertical feet. And notice that I would end up with 12 over 2 would give me 6. The slope of this line is equal to 6. Well, what's the difference between these two roadways? This roadway looks pretty steep. Actually, a truck could not probably drive up a road that, that is that steep. That would be incredibly steep. But this one is even steeper. So the slope, you notice, of this less steep roadway is only 3, while the slope of this steeper roadway is 6. And so the slope uh, is a way of measuring the steepness of our roadway. You might remember we often use the letter M for a general letter for our slope. And the absolute value of the slope because some slopes are negative. If the, if the roadway were to go down as he moves to the right, we would have a negative slope. Um, but the absolute value of the slope measures the steepness of the road. In other words, the bigger a number I have assigned to the slope, like a number of 6, is going to correspond to a steeper roadway than a smaller slope such as 3. 
And that's just because for the same horizontal distance that he moves, two feet in both cases, here his elevation changes only six, here his elevation changes 12. It's a higher elevation change because it is a steeper roadway. Okay, keep this in mind as we go to the next page. So if you turn to the next page, we now have a little bit more realistic situation. Roadways are not completely straight lines. Uh, a truck could be going over the Sierra Mountains or the Rocky Mountains or something like that, going up and down over hillsides near a coast. Um, but roadways are very rarely straight lines. So here's a more realistic situation where the truck is moving along a roadway that is not straight but is curbing. Let's answer this question. Is the steepness of this roadway the same at each point? You're in the truck. Does the roadway feel exactly the same steepness as you move along the curve? With the straight line roadway, at every point, the hillside seems just as steep. But here, as he moves from the point corresponding to x equal 5, to the point corresponding to x equal 10, to this one at 15, and this one at 20, what happens to the steepness of the roadway? It looks as if it's getting steeper and steeper. It would be harder and harder for him to go up this roadway. So we would answer this question, no, the steepness does not seem to be the same at each point. Uh, in this case, it seems like the road is getting steeper and steeper. and steeper as he moves to the right. And of course you could draw other roads that are getting sort of shallower and shallower um, as you move to the right. Well, the question becomes what do we really mean by the steepness? And remember the steepness is really measured by the slope or at least the absolute value of the slope. What do we mean by the steepness, i.e. the slope of a roadway like this at a point. Because in the past, the only way we've been able to figure out the slope is to have a straight line and to use two points on that line in order to find the slope. So when we talked about the slope of a straight line back in algebra, we were really talking about a slope of a curve, a line in that case, through two points. Now we're saying what's the slope at a single point? And yet we do have an intuitive sense of what we mean by the steepness or the slope of this curved hillside. And we can see that at each point, this curved hillside does appear to have a slightly different slope because it has a different steepness. And the slope should really be getting larger and larger, at least in absolute value, as we move along this roadway. So we have an intuitive sense for what we mean by the slope, but somehow we have to define what we mean by the slope of a curve at a particular point. Well, we kind of know in our minds what we mean by how steep this curved roadside is at different points. Let's concentrate on a particular point. I'm going to concentrate on this one that corresponds to x equal 10, and I'm going to call that the point P. So down here, I'm focusing in on this point P. Here's the black roadway that the truck was going through. And what I want you to do is think about these different straight lines that I have drawn through the point P. And I want you to pick out the one that has a slope that we'd think of as matching the slope of this hillside at this point P. So if we look at these different lines, here's a purple line that looks sort of almost perpendicular to the roadway at that point. Is that the same as the slope of the hillside at this point? It doesn't seem like it to me. What about this red line? That also doesn't look too much like what I'd think of as the slope of the line. If we thought of a truck going along the red line, it looks a lot steeper than the slope of the roadway at the point x equal 10. And by the same token, this dark red line doesn't look right either. But which line looks like it has the same slope as what we would intuitively think of as the slope, the slant of the hillside right at that point 
corresponding to x equal 10, to me it looks like it is this blue line right here. And I'm going to put some arrows on the end of it so that we can kind of concentrate on that particular line. You notice that this straight line seems to sort of skim right along the roadway at the point corresponding to x equal 10. Sometimes what we say is this is the line that follows the curve as closely as any straight line can, as close as it's possible for any straight line that goes through P to follow this curve, this is the one that follows it the most closely. These other lines that I drew do not follow the roadway at all well. Well, this blue line is what we call the tangent line to the curve. So I'm going to just fill this in here. It says we call this the tangent line. So the line that seems to have the same slope as the hillside, we call the tangent line to this black curve at that point P. If I pick a different point on the curve, I'll have a different tangent line. So intuitively what we will mean by the tangent line is the straight line that follows the curve most closely. We sometimes say it's the straight line that skims the curve and goes through this point P on the curve. Or we sometimes think of it simply as the straight line that has the same slope as what we intuitively think of as the slope or the steepness of the roadway at that point P. This is a very intuitive definition and in a couple of minutes we will um, talk about a more precise definition of tangent line. But let's just go back to this example up here and make sure that this intuitive definition jives with what we talked about up here. We said it looks like the roadway is getting steeper and steeper as we move, as the truck moves to the right. Well, if I thought about the tangent line to the curve at the point five, it looks like it would be a fairly, a line with a fairly shallow slope. So maybe the tangent line at five would look something like this. I'm trying to make it dark enough that you can see it. And if I looked at the slope of this green tangent line through the point corresponding to five, I'm not quite sure what the slope would be, but very approximately if I looked at two points on this green line, maybe I go over three units and I go up one unit. So the slope at five might be equal to one over three. It has a rise of one over a run of three. If I look at the point P that we were talking about down here and I drew its tangent line before we did it in blue, I'm doing it in green just because my green pen is thinner, maybe that tangent line looks something like this at the point corresponding to x equal 10. And if you picked out two points on that green tangent line and tried to estimate the rise and the run, maybe the run might be two units and the rise might be one. So the slope at that point corresponding to 10 would be equal to a rise of one over a run of two. If I look at the point corresponding to 15, I would have yet another tangent line and it looks like it is a line that's a little bit steeper. And if I pick two points on that green tangent line and go over and up, Maybe I go over two units and I might go up two units. So the slope at this line would be two over two or one. And if I look at this last point that I have marked here at the point corresponding to x equal 20 and draw the tangent line there, it does look like a very steep tangent line corresponding to a very steep slope or a very large slope. And if I pick out two points on this green line, it looks like perhaps a run of one unit and it's not quite clear from here, but maybe a rise of three units. And so the slope of this line would be three over one or three. Well, I just want to ask the question, do the slopes of these tangent lines that we found match this idea that we said over here? We said the road is getting steeper and steeper as the truck moves through these points from x equal 5 up to x equal 20. And sure enough, notice that the numbers for the slopes are getting bigger. This 
tangent line has a slope of one-third, and so we say that the curve has a slope of one-third at that point corresponding to x equal 5. When we get to x equal 10, the slope has gotten to be a larger number. One-half is bigger than one-third. That corresponds to a steeper tangent line, and we say then that the roadway has a slope of one-half at the point corresponding to x equal 10. The slope of the roadway is identical to the slope of its tangent line. And when we get to 15, the slope is increased to an even bigger number, 1. And when we get over here to this point corresponding to x equal 20, the slope is all the way up to the number 3. So we said the roadway intuitively seemed to be getting steeper and steeper, and sure enough, the numbers for our slopes of our tangent lines are getting larger and larger as we move to the right. Okay, the next thing we want to do is to try to define the tangent line in a more precise way. We don't want to just say, well, it's the line that kind of follows the curve closely or it skims along the curve. That's not very precise. If I just sort of eyeball this, I might choose a slightly different line than you choose. Um, and there really is just one tangent line, but we want to be very mathematically precise in the way that we define what we mean by the tangent line to a curve. So let's go ahead and look at the next page and see if we can try to be a bit more precise about that definition of the tangent line. Okay, so next topic, precise definition of the tangent line. And what I want us to do is to consider a general curve, y equal f of x, instead of just this hillside that we had before. So here's my curve, y equal f of x. And we're going to try to define the tangent line to the curve at a specific point on here. It's going to be at the point corresponding to x equal a, and I'm calling that point p. So we're going to go ahead and say that our goal is to write this in purple because I think it's easier to see. Our goal is to define in precise terms what we mean by the tangent line to this curve at P. So I'll say what we mean by the tangent line to the curve at P. So we're going to be concentrating on trying to define in precise terms what we mean by the tangent line to the curve at P. And I can see the tangent line, since this curve looks very much like the hillside we drew on the last page, this tangent line would look something like this. Okay. Before we talk about a tangent line curve, we're going to start by talking about another line, which is referred to as the secant line. So to get to the point of defining what we mean by the tangent line, uh, to this curve at the point P, we're going to start by picking a second point on our black curve, our y equal f of x curve, and I'm going to call that point Q. So we're going to start not with a line that goes through one point, like the tangent line, but with a line that goes through two points on our curve, and I'm just going to use a ruler so that I can draw this fairly accurately for you. So we're going to start with this line that goes through P and Q. This line that goes through two points that we've chosen on the curve is referred to as a secant line. And this is the secant line that goes through the points P and Q. Now what I'm going to do is actually choose another point. I'll also call it Q, but it's really just another point on my curve that's a little bit closer to P, the point where we ultimately want to find our tangent line. So I'm going to choose another point Q here. Uh, so this is also labeled Q. And I'm going to draw the secant line through P and this new Q. You could call them Q1 and Q2 if you want to, but I'm just going to label it Q. And so I've now found a second secant line through another Q that's a little bit closer to P. 
What I sometimes tell students to do is to think of the black curve that represents the graph of y equal f of x as like a piece of wire. Suppose you took a hanger and bent it into this shape. And think of q as being a green bead that is on that hanger. What we've done is we've taken this green bead and we've slid it along the hanger to a new point. And then we've just drawn the line through the original point p and this new point q. Think about continuing this process. I'm going to slide the bead even closer to P and get a third point Q, and I'm going to draw the secant line again. So I'm going to draw the line through P and my third Q, and I get a third secant line. And I continue to do this. Let me draw one more. It's right here. Now I'm going to draw through P and Q, and my line for my curve is so thick it's a little hard to see, but I think you can see this. So here's my fourth secant line, and what I'm ending up with is a sequence of secant lines. And what I want you to do is imagine this green bead coming closer and closer to the point P. We have to have two points for a line to go through. So that's why we use this extra point Q along the curve, but if you thought of a fifth secant line that goes through P and this Q, it's a little hard to draw, but it would be somewhere in here. There's my fifth secant line, and we just continue this process until the Q gets closer and closer and closer to P. And what I want you to do is think about these positions of these secant lines and what are those secant lines getting closer and closer to. If you think about it, they are getting closer and closer to that tangent line that we talked about that was the tangent line to our curve right through the point P. So if I were to draw the tangent line, it would be maybe something like this. So in blue here, I have the tangent line. And notice that the sequence of green secant lines are getting closer and closer to the tangent line. When my green uh, bead here, my Q point slides and becomes right on top of P in that sort of limiting position of the secant lines, I would end up with the tangent line to my curve through the point P. So let's just go through these questions that are right down here and see if we can answer them based on what we've discussed. As Q goes towards P, in other words, as the green bead slides down the curve towards P, what happens to the secant lines, we often abbreviate secant SEC, the secant lines we said are getting closer and closer to the tangent line. So we often use a little arrow like this, as Q approaches P, the secant lines approach the tangent line. So one way of defining the tangent line at P is as follows. We can say that the tangent line at P to our curve is the line that's in the limiting position of the secant lines. We'll say that's in the limiting position of the secant lines the limiting position of the secant lines as what as q slides towards p or we oftentimes just write q approaches the point p so as q gets closer and closer to p along the black piece of wire here as this bead slides down and gets right on top of P, this tangent line is going to be defined as the line that's in the limiting position of that sequence of secant lines as Q gets closer and closer to the point P. 
You may remember from geometry that we also talk about tangent lines to circles back in geometry. So if you've taken a geometry course in high school or in college, you might remember that the tangent line to a point P on a circle also has a definition, and it's usually defined to be the line that just touches the circle at a single point. So uh, we usually define it as the line that touches the circle at one point. We can't really use that definition for a general curve, and I'll show you why. If you thought about maybe extending this black curve y equal f of x, if it were to perhaps go up for a ways and then maybe dive back down, um, you don't have a black pen, sorry about that, but you can see that this tangent line would actually touch the curve y equal f of x in more than one point. So although this definition works for circles, um, it has to do with the nature of a circle that the tangent line will only touch the circle at one point. So that's a great definition for circles, but it doesn't really work for more general curves that might sort of fold back on themselves like this, and our tangent line at P might actually go through the black curve itself at more than one point. So that's why we use this other definition as the limiting position of the secant lines. But just to show you that that does coincide with the definition that you learned back in geometry for circles, you could also choose a second point Q on a circle, and you could draw the secant line through Q and P. So think of a circle made out of a black coat hanger or something like that. You want the tangent line at P. It looks like it's supposed to end up being this line right here, this, I guess, this purple line. Um, so you start with a secant line like this, and then just as we did on this curve, you could allow Q to get a little bit closer to P and draw another secant line. So let me see if I can draw that. And as the Q gets closer to P, we form a sequence of secant lines. So there's another secant line. Here's another Q that's even closer to P. And now I'm getting a secant line that looks something like this. And I hope you can see that when Q gets right on top of P, we would end up with the limiting position of this sequence of secant lines. And it looks to me as if it would end up being something that has the same slope as this tangent line that I drew over here, the line that touches the circle at just one point. So this more general definition that we just discussed, the tangent line being the limiting position of the secant lines, works in the case of a circle and gives us exactly the same tangent line that you learned about back in geometry. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to the next page. Now, the problem is that although we've given a fairly precise definition of the tangent line to a curve at a point P, we said it's the limiting position of this sequence of secant lines, we have not talked about what we really wanted. Remember, what we really wanted to know was the steepness of that hillside at each point as the truck moved along the hillside. And to find the steepness, we needed the slope. So what we are really interested in is not the tangent line so much as the slope of the tangent line. So that's what this comment is here at the top. The problem is we only know how to find the slope of a line through two points. Uh, we don't really have a way of finding the slope of a line if it's just the tangent line and we only know one point that it goes through. So I put this little question here do you have a suggestion of how we could find the slope of the tangent line if we only know the slope uh, of a line through two points and the tangent line is going through just one known point on the curve? Well, 
we could go back to this idea of where the tangent line came from. Remember that the tangent line came from this sequence of secant lines. So what I'd like you to do is think about picking that second point Q on our curve and creating a secant line through P and Q. And I'm going to ask you the question, well, maybe we have trouble finding the slope of the tangent line because it only goes through the one point P, but could we find the slope of this secant line? So can we find the slope of this secant line? And yeah, we should be able to because uh, now we have a line that goes through two points on our curve. So let's go ahead and see if we can find the slope of the secant line. Uh, that would be a line that goes through this point P. Notice that corresponds to an x value of A, and this point Q corresponds to some other particular x value. I'm just going to call it x, make it a little bit simple. And if I want the slope of this green secant line, it's not too hard to do. All I have to do is find the change in the y values over the change in the x values as we move from P to Q along this straight secant line. And that's something we know how to do. Well, of course, I've got an input here for x. Uh, x is changing from A up to some unknown value x over here but I don't have my outputs drawn on my graph, so let me figure out the corresponding output. If I plug A into this function, remember this is also a point on the black curve, that means that the output should be this function evaluated at this input. So the output here would be F evaluated at my input A. If I plug a general X value into my curve, uh, notice Q is also on the black curve, so I have an output associated with uh, this X value, and that would be F of whatever particular X value I've chosen over here. Well, can I find the slope of that green line? The slope, I'll write down here, of this secant line is supposed to be just the change in the Y values over the change in the x values. Let me go ahead and draw a little triangle in here where this will be the change in my x values and this will be the change in my y values. And what is the change in the x values, in other words the difference of the x values, as I move from a to x, it'll be x my higher value minus A, my lower value. So the change in the X values here, a little equal sign, is X minus A. And how about the change in the Y values, that's the vertical distance that I move as I move along this green secant line, or equivalently as I move along the curve. The change in the Y values is just my higher Y value, which is F of X minus my lower y value, which is f of a. This height is exactly the same as the difference between these two y values. It's the same as this height on the y-axis. So the slope of my secant line is the change in y, that's f of x minus f of a, divided by the change in my x values, x minus a. And let me just sort of write that down as a little formula because we will refer back to that. The slope of this green secant line is the difference in the y values, f of x minus f of a, over the difference in the x values, x minus a. Okay, great. So we found the slope of the secant line, but that's not what we want. What we want is the slope of the tangent line to the curve at P. Well, how do I get from the secant lines to a tangent line? Well, to get to the tangent line, what do we have to do with that green point Q? Remember, what we have to do is to move Q closer to P. So I would have to choose a new Q 
So here's my second Q. It would actually correspond to a different value on the x-axis, a different x value, but I would go ahead and draw the secant line through those two points, my original point P and my new Q. I would get a new secant line and the x change in x will change and the change in y will change. So let's concentrate on this picture where I have a new Q and I'm going to redraw that red triangle for the new Q. So I'm now going to have a red triangle that looks like this and I'll have a new delta x for my new Q and I'll have a new delta y for my new point Q. The formula will actually be exactly the same because I have a new x value but the output would still be called f of x and so the slope of this new secant line will have exactly the same formula f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Um, but let's go ahead and see if we can decide what's happening to x as q slides down the curve towards p. So as I go from this q to one that's closer to p, let's see if we can figure out what's happening to the x. Here's the original x that corresponds to the x-coordinate of my original q. Here's the new x that corresponds to the x-coordinate of my new q. And what's happening to the x as we move our point Q, as we move that green bead farther and farther down the wire towards P. Yeah, it looks like the X is getting closer and closer to the A value. So what happens to X as P gets, as Q gets closer and closer to P along the curve? We could say that X is getting closer and closer to A. Well, I didn't write the answer to this. We talked about it, but I didn't write it in. To get to the tangent line, what must we do with Q? Q must move down the curve towards P. And as Q moves down the curve towards P, X is getting closer and closer to the value A. Now let's try and answer this last question. What happens to the slope of the secant line as X gets closer and closer to A? So as x gets closer and closer to a, which corresponds to q getting closer and closer to p, what's happening to the slope of the secant lines? Well, notice that as x gets closer and closer to a, these secant lines are getting closer and closer to which line? The secant lines are getting closer and closer to the tangent line because that's the way we define the tangent line. We said that it is the line in the limiting position of these secant lines. So these secant lines are getting closer and closer to the tangent line. So secant lines are approaching the tangent line. And what does that mean about the slope of the secant lines? they must be getting closer and closer to, in slope to the slope of the tangent line. So the slope of the secant lines must be, it's changing, 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 and since the tangent lines, the secant lines are getting closer and closer to the tangent line, the slope of these green secant lines must be getting closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line. So as x approaches a, the slopes of the secant lines are getting closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line. Well, let's go ahead and look at the next page and see how we can write this in a more formal way. We're going to try to write that fact that we just discussed, the fact that as x gets closer and closer to a, the slope of the secant line is getting closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line. And we're going to try to write that fact using a limit, using the limit notation that we looked at earlier. And the way I'm going to do that is to go ahead and write down the slope of the tangent line. And I'm going to write down this idea of the secant lines getting closer and closer to the tangent line and the slopes of the secant lines getting closer and closer to the slope of the tangent lines using a limit.
So the slope of the tangent line, that'll be that ultimate blue line that we looked at, the slope of that line, is going to be equal to the limiting value of the slopes of these green secant lines, and it'll be the limit as x gets closer and closer to a. It's really just a way of writing this phrase right up here using our limit notation from the last, um, the last sections. So as x gets closer and closer to a, slopes of the secant lines are approaching the slope of the tangent line. In other words, the slope of the tangent line would equal the limiting value of those slopes of those secant lines as x gets closer and closer to a. And that is, in fact, how we write the precise definition of the slope of the tangent line. So here's a nice precise definition. The tangent line to the curve y equal f of x at the point P, and you notice the x coordinate of that point P is A, and the y coordinate, well, what did we say the y coordinate was? We wrote that on our last page, I'll just to remind you. Here's the point P, its x coordinate is A, and its y coordinate was F evaluated at A. So that's the coordinates, x and y coordinates of the point P. So I'm going to fill that in here. The tangent line to the curve y equal f of x at this point p, which has coordinates a comma f of a, is the line through p with this specific slope that we just talked about, with a slope, which we usually write slope of the tangent line, we usually write it with a little subscript like that, which is simply equal to the limit as x approaches a, and right here we're going to put slope of the secant lines. That's what we had up here. Slope of the tangent line is the limit as x approaches a of the slopes of the secant lines. But what is the slope of the secant lines? What is this? Well, we actually figured out um, an expression for the slope of the secant line on the previous page. So let me put that page on again for a moment so that I can remind you. Remember, we derived the slope of the secant line right here. We said the slope of the secant line is just the difference in the y's over the difference in the x's. It was f of x minus f of a, all divided by x minus a. So I'm just going to replace what we call the slope of the secant line with this expression that we found. So I'm just going to set that to right here for a moment so we can use that to fill this in. But the slope of the tangent line would be the limit as x approaches a of the slopes of the secant lines, and I'm just going to fill in what the slopes of the secant lines is according to our expression from the previous page. It's f of x minus f of a all divided by x minus a. Uh, I should mention, though, like any limit, that limit may exist or it may be a limit that does not exist. So we're going to say provided this limit exists. We'll talk later in this section about um, scenarios uh, in which that limit does not exist. So this now becomes our very precise definition of tangent line. And we say the tangent line to this curve at the point P is the line through P that has this slope. The slope is equal to the limit as x approaches a of the slopes of the secant lines. And that's really what's sitting here. It's just the slopes of the secant lines. It's the change in the y over the change in the x's on the secant lines, provided this limit exists. Well, um, this is a great definition for the tangent line and the slope of the tangent line. Um, a great way uh, to express it in terms of our picture, but in practice there's a slightly easier form for the slope of the tangent line. And so I want to show you that slightly easier form, and that all boils down to giving this distance between the value x equal a and the value x equal some other value x a specific name. We're going to call this change in x h. 
if we do that, then we can go ahead and rewrite things a little bit. You notice that if we're starting out at A and we move H units to the right to some new value X, then X would have to be equal to A plus, and let's try to fill in this little green blank over here, uh, well, it would be A plus the number of units we move to the right, so it would be A plus H. I also want you to notice that as X gets closer and closer to A, in other words, as my Q slides down the curve towards P, and this X gets closer and closer to A, that we can answer this question, what happens to H? So as X moves over closer to A, can you see what happens to H? H is going to get smaller because I'm going to choose a new X that's here, and now my H would only be this long. So if you think of a new Q being right here, you would end up having a new H that is smaller. And as X gets all the way to A, the H is going to shrink smaller and smaller towards zero. So as X approaches A, just notice that H is approaching zero. It's getting smaller and smaller and limiting towards zero. Okay, let me write down again the slope of the tangent line the way we originally had the expression written. We said it's the limit as x gets closer and closer to a of f of x minus f of a all divided by x minus a. Well, with the introduction of this new variable h, I can rewrite this and I'm going to write it this way. It will be the limit. And now instead of x approaching a, remember we said that's equivalent to h approaching 0. So I'm going to use the fact that x getting closer and closer to a means that h is getting closer and closer to 0. So limit as x approaches a is the same as allowing this new uh, variable h to approach 0. I can also rewrite this x that's right in here. If I can get my pen to work. This x is the same thing as a plus h, we said. So I'm going to replace the x that I see in here with an a plus h. And I'm going to do the same thing down here. Here's x again. I'm going to replace that with a plus h. So let me do that. I would have f of, and instead of x, I'm just going to write it as a plus this new variable that we've defined, h. I'm going to leave the rest alone, minus f of a. Down here, I'm going to replace this x with a plus h. And then I still have a minus a underneath. And so let's go ahead and simplify. You notice that in the denominator, the a's drop out. I have a plus a and a minus a. Those add up to 0. And so I would get the slope of the tangent line is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a, all divided by, and I have nothing left but h in the denominator. The reason that I like to start out with this definition, limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a, it's a little bit easier to see that that, in fact, is the same thing as the slope of the secant line. It's clearer that this is really a change in y values on the slope of the secant line, and that this x minus a is a change in x values along the slope of the secant line. That's a little bit more hidden when we introduce this new variable h, but notice h really is the change in the x values on our secant line, and that the f of a plus h minus f of a, if you look at this, our x is equal to a plus h, so the y coordinate of this point q is actually f evaluated at a plus h. So what's in the numerator here really is the difference in the y values if we were to look at the secant line that goes through p and q. So what's in the numerator is still the change in the y values on the secant line. 
um, but it's a little more hidden in this form. However, this form is quite a bit easier to apply to most of our calculations where we have a, an actual uh, formula for a given function and we're asked to find the slope of the tangent line to that function at some specific value and they'll always give us the value of a. So this form is preferable for calculating actual slopes of tangent lines to given functions. And that's what we're going to do next. So let's go ahead now and try to apply the formula that we just developed. We'll apply this easier form of the formula for the slope of the tangent line to a specific function at a specific value of a. So let's look at this example, and I think it will help us to understand the formula a little bit better. We're going to look at the function f of x equals x squared. So that's our standard parabola. It has a vertex at the origin. You can think of it as y equal x squared. And we're going to find both the slope, and later towards the end we'll find the equation of the tangent line at this point p that corresponds to an x-coordinate of 2. And you notice that if x is 2, the output value on this parabola would be 2 squared, or 4. So we're going to be finding the tangent line slope and equation at that point. And before we even start, let's eyeball what that tangent line would look like. And this won't be exact, but whatever equation we come up with should have a graph that looks pretty close to what we think of intuitively as the tangent line. And remember, the tangent line is the line that follows the curve as closely as any line can through the point P. So it's supposed to have the same sort of steepness as what we would think of intuitively as the steepness of the black curve right at the point P. And so it looks to me like the tangent line would be something like this. And if we graph the equation that we eventually get from our formula, it should be pretty close to this blue line that we just drew. Okay, I'm going to write out our formula. So let's write the formula in general. We said the slope of the tangent line at A at an x-coordinate of a point, uh, or a point with an x-coordinate of a, would be the limit as h goes to zero, so this is just the formula from the last page, of this kind of complicated expression. It's f evaluated at a plus h minus f evaluated at a, and that whole thing is going to be divided by h. Well, notice in this case we don't want the slope of the tangent line at some general value of a. We're finding the slope of the tangent line at the a value of 2. Uh, that's the x-coordinate of the point where we're finding the slope of the tangent line. So we are finding the slope of the tangent line at an a value of 2. So that means everywhere I see an a in my formula, I'm going to want to replace that with the value 2. That's just the x-coordinate of the point where we want to find our slope. So slope of the tangent line at 2 would be the limit as h approaches 0 of, and now I would have f of, let's see if I can write that in red so that it's a little bit easier to see what we've substituted. I'm going to find f of 2 plus h minus f of 2. And that's just because I want the slope of the tangent line not just at any old point, but at specifically at the point corresponding to an x value of 2. Well, now we still have to figure out what these expressions would be. We want to know what is f of 2 plus h and what is f of 2 for this specific function, f of x equals x squared. Well, let's sort of do that over on the side. Remember that if I have f of x equals x squared, a nice way of evaluating f at these, others, um, at these other input values is to rewrite our function with empty parentheses everywhere we see an x. 
What does that mean? It means f of whatever I throw into my function for this particular function is whatever I throw into my function squared. So in particular, if I throw in 2 into my function, then I should end up getting 2 squared. We actually already computed that when we were trying to find the y-coordinate of our point, and we got an output value of 4. So this thing in my formula here, let me put a little arrow here, this thing is going to turn out to just be the number 4. All right, let's go ahead and find f of the other expression that I see in my numerator, f of 2 plus h right here. So I'm going to put a 2 plus h as the input into my function. Well, if I fill in the empty parentheses on the right, f of 2 plus h for this particular function is the quantity 2 plus h squared. So let's go ahead and write that out now.